Hello and welcome to um, slides 2.7. Uh, the title here is Refusnik's intro and by this I mean that this is the first presentation of a series that we're going to have on um, conscientious objectors in Israel. I have already uh, mentioned um, in the slides on Yesh Kvul that um, in Israel there is this, uh, since the 1980s, there is this particular uh, form of objection which is a selective uh, conscientious objection and it relates, it refers to objecting to serve in the occupied territories and therefore being part of an army of occupation. So I'm going to present present here in this set of slides a number of common features between common features but also differences between these various organizations and that we're going to see them if not individually at least in groups so in um, I would like to start with a quote from um, sorry by a very famous intellectual um, that we will encounter again in the section in section number four. Um, he was um, a very religious, um, orthodox um, intellectual person, Jew, um, as well as a scientist. And he um, took, after 1967, he took a really very, very strong stand against um, the occupation and against uh, not returning the territories but keeping them as one of the elements that would corrupt the fabric uh, the moral fabric of uh, Israel in general, of Israeli society, and of the army, too. And um, I'm not sure on which occasion, but um, yes, one of his most known, best known quotes is, um, if 500 officers and soldiers will refuse, then the earth will shake here. And uh, we now have uh, more than 500 officers and counting and growing. And I've listed here just some numbers of some of the organizations that um, uh, belong to this group of um, so-called refusenik organizations, meaning um, organizations that coordinate or protect or uh, defend um, soldiers uh, who decide to uh, object to serving in the occupied territories. So the first organization that we're going to be looking at is in, it's called Courage to Refuse. And um, as we will see, it started out on a letter, the combatant's letter um, of 50, with 50 signatures, and it has now reached 630. We then have the pilot's letter, about which I'm not going to talk much, because it recalls a little bit the combatant's letter, um, which carried 27 other signatures. We have Combatant for Peace, which is a joint Israeli and Palestinian organization of former combatants, um, now turned to nonviolence, which is another 200. And we have Breaking the Silence, which is not really an, an organization of, um, of conscientious objectors. Uh, it's actually an organization of soldiers who return from serving in the occupied territory and denounce um, themselves, their, their own um, attitudes and behaviors and their own silence then, um, and therefore try to correct their own wrongdoing by speaking um, out after, um, upon their return, which is another thousand people, and the Shministim, which uh, would translates, translates as um, 12th graders, and these are um, 12 graders who are actually total conscientious objectors again um, after all these other ones which, uh, who actually were, um, uh, who actually, actually had served in the army before turning to um, being refusenics. So um, in this, uh, on top of all this, we have to add those of Yashkvul that we have already seen in the 1980s. Um, in the middle of the second intifada in 2002, when um, Courage to Refuse was um, established, um, Yashkbul was no longer um, at the center of the mobilization, and moreover, it was perceived, quite wrongly I would say, but it was perceived to be too associated with the radical left. While Courage to Refuse, as we will see in the next presentation, was interested in appearing mainstream and attracting the mainstream. Yeshkvul had, in its days, challenged the state monopolies on security, 
so that, um, um, quoting obviously, each individual could obtain a space to decide where, when and in which circumstances he would undertake his military du duties. Um, and this was uh, perceived as very, um, as, as not too, uh, not mainstream enough for uh, those who wrote um, the letter that established courage to refuse. Um, what I um, would like also, uh, we will return on courage to refuse in the next set of slides, but um, what it's interesting, what's important to remember is that as in other cases, that we have already seen and, and, and as in other cases that we will see. For example, if we look at gender activism that will be next week, uh, most those who belong to these organizations um, share a very similar socio social and demographical profile, middle class, highly educated, secular, Ashkenazi of origin, and they also present a very similar, although not identical, um, rhetoric. And um, the difference between, um, between these groups is that while we have, for example, Yeshkvul and Courage to Refuse, um, that um, return on the image of the fighter and on the, on the discourse of the security to legitimate their position on the public sphere. In other words, I have fought, I have seen, I'm ready to go and fight again to protect my family and my homeland, but I will not, uh, therefore I know what it is, I'm a fighter, I know what it is to, to fight, but I will not use this know-how, if you like, to uh, oppress another um, population. Um, but this is really the position of um, the, more, the most mainstream of, of these organizations, which is Courage to Refuse, and which is also shared a little bit um, in the attitude of the pilot's letter. I, I strongly encourage you to listen to the um, interview by Jonathan Shapiro, uh, which is listed in your, among your links, uh, which is quite um, uh, an interesting and uh, um, testimony of his choice of uh, becoming a refusenik. Um, he was one of the signatures of the pilot's letter. So, if we look at Yeshkvul and Courage to Refuse and the pilot's letter, we see that these uh, refuseniks not only share a common uh, socio-demographical uh, profile and the same um, uh, and promote the same image of the fighter um, to legitimate their, their refusal, basically, they also um, can be seen as um, representative of the Israeli militaristic or militarist um, ethos. Um, because again, their refusal is based on, um, on their choice, uh, on their evaluation uh, over which war or campaign can be considered just or unjust, moral or immoral. Um, so what we see is that they use the dominant codes of Israeli militarism that I've already mentioned to project a different uh, message. Um, in particular, um, courage to refuse gained its legitimacy from um, uh, from having fought during the Second Intifada, which is a very traumatic time, certainly for Palestinians, but also for Israelis, um, as a means of legitimization for their refusal. Um, now, unlike them, members of two other organizations called New Profile and the Shministim, the 12th graders, are younger and more radical and see themselves not at all as mainstream but as radical activists. Um, they have an anti-militaristic um, attitude, they're post-nationalists, they are feminists, um, men uh, and women um, alike. So um, this, this, uh, this is the reason why there are so many um, organizations of uh, refusers, because they really tend to represent um, different uh, souls inside the Israeli society, but they all share a very, very strong um, opinion and a very clear opinion about what what is 
uh, one of the underlying causes for the um, ongoing conflict. That is, the, of course, the, um, the continuation of the occupation and the army being placed at the service of the continuation of such a uh, of the occupation of which the settlers are the uh, symbol and uh, one of the mechanisms of the ingraining um, of the mechanisms that aim, that make the occupation uh, work. So um, this is, was just a brief introduction. We will start now with Courage to Refuse, um, starting from actually their website. Thank you. See you there.